my talk will be a provocative talk. Uh, I want to uh, provoke uh, the young scholars and also the more experienced persons here uh, with some uh, fresh ideas. Uh, the field of uh, literary theory, critical theory, postmodernism, all the different aspects of uh, literary theory uh, is being shaken up in a way that uh, has not happened since in the last several decades, uh, since this field uh, emerged. Uh, and this is being shaken up by artificial intelligence. Finally, addresses on the topic of postmodernism and of his own volition, he has tried to uh, expand the area and also talk about AI. And that's going, going to be kind of bonus for us. Thank you very much, sir. Malhotraji, over to you. Namaste, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is my first time in this conference. But you know, when I was looking through the list of papers and speakers, I was very impressed. Uh, a large number of uh, uh, scholars on a large number of topics across the board on postmodernism and critical theory, literary theory in general. Uh, this is very impressive. Now, the, that's the good news part. Uh, I also want to make, my talk will be a provocative talk. Uh, I want to uh, provoke uh, the young scholars and also the more experienced persons here uh, with some uh, fresh ideas. Uh, the field of uh, literary theory, critical theory, postmodernism, all the different aspects of uh, literary theory uh, is being shaken up in a way that uh, has not happened since in the last several decades. Uh, since this field uh, emerged. Uh, and this is being shaken up by artificial intelligence. Uh, it, it's being shaken up in such a serious way. And yet, hardly anyone in the field of postmodernism or literary theory or any, any of these related areas seems to be aware of this big tsunami that is coming. It's not just coming, it's not coming 30 years later or 100 years later, or it's like right now. And I will tell you what's happening. Artificial intelligence it has been developing uh, algorithms which learn on their own. Uh, they learn what you read, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, they can mimic you, so they can talk like you. Uh, they can, they can, uh, uh, algorithms are being used to generate text. So the question is who's de deconstructing that? How do you deconstruct text when the agency is not a human agency, the agency that is developing it, you can't say this is Brahmanical voice or this is whatever voice or something. Uh, you cannot deconstruct using the kind of vocabulary and the kind of tools that uh, the people in, uh, in, in, in theory are used to. The, the, what you've been raised on, what you are being taught, none of those are going to be valid. None of those apply because now you are deconstructing a text. Uh, whose author is not a human author. So what are you going to do? How are you going to locate this algorithm in the space that you know, gender space or whatever space that you've been taught? Because this is an algorithm. It's not even a human. It is not conscious. Now, it, let me explain to you what is going on. First, I'll tell you, then I'll give you the implications. There are chatbots, chatbots, which are uh, uh, computer programs that are mimicking humans and answering questions, uh, engaged in debate, uh, uh, supporting somebody, opposing somebody. Uh, a large percentage of these automated chatbots that uh, the Google and the Facebook and all these, uh, and a whole lot of private companies are throwing out in the social media, they're actually just algorithms, very intelligent algorithms uh, that are constantly becoming smarter and smarter based on, uh, based on the feedback. Uh, a, algorithms are being used to write emails without human involvement, write editorials. There was a, there was a competition recently where people in the AI field were invited to write algorithm, write, uh, uh, have their algorithms compose an editorial, an editorial of 800 words on some topic. And so this algorithm went searching the entire internet for that topic picking up what's the latest news. The topic could be trade war with China. It could be something about what's happening in Kashmir, whatever the topic is. Uh, uh, it, it's able to compile information, figure out what's going on, 
construct a very well written good english with lot lot of logic with a flow uh, something that is so interesting that human beings human editors uh, in 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 various newspapers and magazines when they are given this these uh, these editorials some of them written by machines some of them composed by human beings and they are asked to evaluate what they think of this they are not able to tell the difference they are not able to tell th these two are from a machine or these three are from a machine they are not able to tell so if experts are not able to tell whether it's a man or a machine writing all this that's pretty impressive algorithms are also able to compose music same story there have been contests where algorithmically generated music is being seen as hey this is pretty good and we can't tell the difference art so you see what is happening is algorithms are composing using natural language processing nlp which is a huge topic in computer science the understanding of natural language so how to how to understand human language uh, be a, and being able to tell the motive of uh, a a piece that you are reading is this motive you know good bad left wing right wing is it for against a topic sentiment analysis there's something called sentiment analysis which looks at the sentiments it's all algorithms evaluating millions of messages that are out there to see what is the sentiment on a given topic what is the sentiment on the caa uh, issue that's going on while there are riots and there are farmers there are farmer riot going on somewhere what is the sentiment on that so the the algorithms rather than humans are the agencies evaluating the discourse evaluating the discourse deconstructing the discourse forget us deconstructing the algorithm right now the algorithm is deconstructing our narratives so these algorithms are behaving more and more like human agency in in the way they, the in the analysis of narr narratives in deconstructing narratives and in coming up with new narratives so it's not only a participant in terms of evaluating and intervening with the 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 discourse but also pu putting its own discourse into the mix now here is the interesting uh, an interesting point a lot of people are mixed up and muddled and confused including some ai people because they think that since machines are not conscious the, since machines are not conscious they are not able to do these things but let me tell you this being conscious has nothing to do with whether it can behave and mimic in an intelligent manner so machine intelligence and algorithmic uh, you know development of discourse and intervention with discourse and a deconstruction of our human discourse has nothing to do with whether these machines are conscious or they are not conscious and they are not going to become conscious but still natural language processing is a field in computer science which has advanced in the to the point where it's able to make algorithms behave in this manner so the the first point i want to make is algorithms have arrived as discourse participants uh, they'll argue with you they'll deconstruct you they'll block you they have they have more authority than you and i have because all these social media are are being driven by algorithms don't think that mark zuckerberg is sitting there deciding what to think and who to block it's not human beings uh, they've uh, turned loose algorithms given some general rules to these algorithms general policies general biases general preferences uh, and and the algorithms then go and implement this in a very large scale after all there are billions of people sending billions of messages it is humanly impossible to manage and control all that and yet it is being controlled the social media discourse is being controlled with with certain agendas with certain things allowed certain things encouraged certain things not encouraged uh, if i write, if i put out a video with a certain message and and i use the word kashmir or i use the word modi or any one of these or trump or whether i use the word you know china whatever i mean there are all these algorithms they look up whatever what is this guy saying is he for this is he against that uh, and then there are rules on what we they'll allow what they will not allow who will be shadow banned who will be blocked who will get a warning uh, so the algorithms are taking over the public discourse and uh, uh, this is the first point uh, that i want uh, you to understand and this has nothing to do with whether these algorithms are uh, conscious or not so the dominant discourse and the new deep structures the deep structures 
are not the the old structures that you know this is gender structure this is a structure about uh, you know post colonial and what not the algorithms are creating new just uh, structures about social justice about about climate change about uh, human rights so the the discussion on these topics uh, is shifting away from the kind of things that you uh, all of you are used to reading uh, and a whole new a uh, whole new uh, kind of discourse which is machine generated is taking over this is a very important thing uh, for the profession uh, that that uh, the, the, all of the scholars here are in so uh, if you know the history a new world view called humanism emerged a, a, a world view called humanism emerged uh, many generations ago in in europe and humanism was a big revolution in in thought and humanism one of its one of the out, offshoots of humanism was liberalism so what we call liberalism is an offshoot of humanism that whole movement is based on humanism now humanism itself is being attacked by by ai uh, and i and i won't go into that here because that's a huge topic on its own uh but in my book on ai i've talked about all these things I've, i i have written a recent book called artificial intelligence and the future of power uh you you got, those who are interested can uh, it, it, it it's uh, it's been out for uh, several weeks uh you can look up and in here i'm talking about uh how uh ai uh, ai is actually defeating ai is a product of liberalism by the way ai is a product of materialism liberalism uh, and ai is it's now threatening its own origin it's threatening the very humanism which gave birth to it this is a very interesting topic which is kind of uh, for those who are who want to go even deeper uh, now the the uh, elephant in the room is uh, how do you de deconstruct an algorithm uh, you know we are used to deconstructing hum human human discourse but how do you deconstruct an algorithm how do you how do you even know what what how this algorithm is working how do you attribute uh, motive to this algorithm this is a very interesting point that you have to use so now the now now let's look at where do the how do these algorithms learn a child is trained by the environment it's being brought in brought up in by the kind of reading material by the kind of uh, you know narratives that the child is exposed to a student even a human being keeps learning based on whatever discourse you are given and you as postmodernists know there is no such thing as neutral everything has a bias because the people who generate it have a bias so somebody may say this is this is the absolute grand narrative but that's not true that grand narrative uh, includes in it a point of view a, a particular tilt a particular bias in it similarly in the case of ai the algorithms are not something that a programmer puts together the algorithm learns learns by processing examples 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 it goes on processing it goes on learning through through analysis of data data that constitutes a lot of examples millions of examples so what are the whatever data is being fed to train the algorithm gives it the bias so let me just tell you this suppose a child is raised in a hindu gurukulam he'll have a certain point of view suppose a child is raised in a muslim madrasa he'll have a certain point of view different one suppose a child is raised in a in a catholic uh, school he will be raised he'll have a different point of view suppose he's raised in a maoist marxist uh, training camp he'll have a different point of view everybody knows that so now if you take these texts and train algorithms those algorithms will also have that point of view if you take the entire library of discourse developed in madrasas and use that to train algorithms they will have that point of view that's how algorithms are if you train them on the the text of the vedic tradition all the all the commentaries and all the analysis they'll have a certain the algorithm will have a certain point of view so like that i could go on giving you examples that there is no such thing as a neutral algorithm the algorithms are biased the way humans are biased because the algorithms are trained using text the way humans are trained and these texts are are the product of previous uh, people and so hence they contain a kind of historical bias so what i'm saying is no, two things first thing i said 
that algorithms are taking over more and more of the text business, not only evaluating, but also producing new text, uh, passing commentary, evaluating, ju judging, and more and more editors are using this, more and more uh, you know, thinkers are using it, think tanks are using it, certainly social media is using it, certainly politicians are using it. That is one point. Second point is that these algorithms are not neutral. Now they will tell you that this is a very neutral algorithm and it's going to, uh, it's going to block you if you say bad things. But who decides what is bad things? Uh, they will say that uh, social, uh, they have terms like uh, violating uh, social, uh, social norms. So you are being blocked for violating uh, you know, social norms. Well, who decides what are social norms? Uh, according to, uh, according to uh, uh, you know, YouTube, uh, anytime I put out a, a video promoting Ayurveda, uh, they would send me a warning message saying, uh, this would be the algorithm sending me a warning message, uh, that uh, this is being flagged. So they consider Ayurveda to be biased and uh, allopathy to be normal. Uh, so this is somebody's point of view. I mean, this is the people who, who were turned loose these algorithms and made these policies. So somebody makes the policy and the algorithm goes according to the policy. My team challenges this and then YouTube gives it to human beings to evaluate because they have a capability that uh, if you escalate the challenge, then the humans will evaluate. Always the humans come back and say, we don't think there's a bias in what you said, that you're not fine, but we can't, uh, we can't uh, overrule the algorithm, sir. We work here. Uh, we, we agree with you, but the algorithm has decided this. So this algorithm is becoming a big boss. Uh, even inside these big companies, even their own employees cannot override the algorithms. So this is a very serious situation for anybody. And I'm surprised that the people in literary theory and critical theory have not discovered this and they have not made a noise about it because your, your whole purpose is to look for biases and look for how to deconstruct narratives and figure out what's hidden, in, hidden messages in them, hidden points of view that are not normal. This is now happening with algorithms on a very gigantic scale. Now, now the computers are able to turn this over on a very massive scale. So you don't even need human beings to do all this. So, you, so what is happening is the pyramid of power, where at the top are people who control these algorithms, who have points of view, who have agendas. And that is, that is in these algorithms in the form of whatever, whatever texts are being used for training purposes. So I asked Google, I asked some Google people, because they are generating, a, they're developing a next generation engine, uh, you know, that will compete with GPT-3. GPT-3 is one of these things uh, that uh, an organization put together. It's very famous, uh, and and it's it's able to understand text, and it has been it has done this by reading and uh, being trained on you know millions and millions of pages of uh, various kinds of writings. So it's it's incorporated all that, and now it knows how to uh, how to judge and evaluate and understand meaning. So everybody is competing against GPT-3. The China has announced something which is going to be much bigger than GPT-3. Many more, much bigger vocabulary, much more uh, content China is doing. Uh, Google has announced its own Google Brain, and and that is called uh, Microsoft has something. Uh, uh, you know, F Facebook has something. All these guys, all the digital giants, are are racing each other to compete against GPT-3. So when you ask uh, people, when I ask the Google people, how are you? training the algorithm when it comes to something like Indian culture, Indian civilization. And the answer is, oh, there is a large body of academic works. So I said, academic works written by whom? Uh, and, and, and so when they showed me, those are, those are exactly the people I'm fighting and arguing with all the time. They are biased. They are, they are colonized. They have what I call Hindu phobia. Uh, they are involved in what I call breaking India, which is, with, with, and so their texts are the legitimate texts in the eyes of the Western Academy. That is the text that is legitimate. Those are the texts that are quoted by the newspapers in, in, the, in, in, the, in the international press. So the AI algorithms are using those very texts for learning. So now what you'll find is all of this Hindu phobia and breaking India forces and the kind of stuff that uh, people like me are fighting, I, I in particular for three decades or four decades, all of that kind of bias is now going to come in, in the form of algorithms. This is a serious matter. So now, now uh, and Wikipedia, a lot of them are, to be, are training their algorithms on Wiki, using Wikipedia. But Wikipedia is not a kind of an absolute neutral source. Which Wikipedia has its biases. The Wikipedia entry on me is biased because uh, when I challenge something, they, 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 don't, they don't accept my word. They've accepted somebody else's word because everybody is allowed to participate 
but you you are rated in terms of your ranking different people have different ranking a person of higher rank can overrule what you've written because whatever you edit you put in a person of higher ranking in the wikipedia scheme can override it so it's a it's again a system of power there is a hierarchy of power it is not a democracy like people think there is a hierarchy of power within wikipedia even one of the one of the the the, the founders of wikipedia whom i know well in in interviews with me has said that so Uh, where do you get text that is neutral well you cannot get text that's neutral whatever text you get has some kind of bias in it and so that's the bias that goes into the algorithms which are being trained using such text now the the uh, there is a movement uh, in the us which is trying to fight this uh, algorithmic bias uh, blacks have complained that uh, algorithms are whether they are intentional or not but they are biased racially the reason they are biased racially is that many of these algorithms have been trained on uh, uh, on on texts and on history of uh, law and crime and uh, all of that which is biased because blacks are stereotyped in those texts uh, they are considered inferior they are more likely to have violence and be criminals according to those that that, that kind of uh, date big data and the algorithms are taken over that bias feminists have argued that the bias the, these algorithms have gender bias lgbtqa people are by, uh, are fighting some of them litigating that these uh, some of these algorithms are biased so the biases uh, of these algorithms is not something novel the new idea i'm telling you i'm just bringing it in a different context but the there are different groups uh, uh, different human rights groups and different public interest groups that are already fighting the digital giants taking them to court saying that their algorithms are biased and hence all the stuff they put out and how they filter out news and what they consider to be right wrong and all that is being evaluated and adjudicated by biased algorithms so this uh, this uh, uh, account, there is this whole field called uh, demanding transparency of algorithms uh, demanding that there be bi- there be there be accountability of algorithms uh, there are people who are suing the algorithms for bias and then the question is who are you going to sue well you're going to sue the owner of the uh, algorithm he may say i i didn't do this i am not a biased person the point is that it's your algorithm it's like saying that uh, the car uh, had the accident and i didn't do anything the point is it's your car and you you ultimately have control over it so uh, the, the, in the in the defense of the algorithm people these algorithms really you know the the developer really does not uh, know how the bias came in if i'm an if I, i'll just write an algorithm and tell it to learn through experience and the kind, the the experience it's having maybe 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 in a community where one point of view is dominant and so the algorithm picks it up uh, if i turn my algorithm loose in a certain type of community and and i said go learn from them listen to what they are saying and learn 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 the way you know child learns by listening uh, this this algorithm will not be a neutral algorithm because the the views and the tilt Uh, in the in in that community will be assimilated into that algorithm's own uh, mindset so the uh, the problem is the problem that india faces as a result of this is very unique uh, so far i've told you what is generally a problem nothing to do with india in particular uh, people in the united states and europe are who are at the cutting edge of ai uh, are are in dialogue i am part of that group are in dialogue with people in literary theory and critical theory to see you know how how does it revolutionize critical theory because it revolutionized critical theory what i'm now talking about is going to become very common knowledge commonly talked about in future conferences like this ai will be definitely be there i'm just ahead of this thing i'm just giving you this uh, you know uh, sort of maybe we are ahead of ourselves maybe we we are talking about things that the community of uh, scholars ought to know but doesn't know uh but what i'm telling you is this is the, is the following the the uh the the disc, the ai as a voice as a as a development voice in narrative and a critical voice in controlling narratives because ai is 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 owned by these very big giants and these giants have a lot to say about what narrative flourishes what narrative is blocked which narrative is given a high rating and everybody likes it they are controlling the narrative and the ai is their weapon ai is the tool the device through which they are controlling this so what i'm telling you is that this is in the hands of people with an agenda 
this is another thing i'm telling you i'm looking at whether i'm looking at these the 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 people who are who are into this digital economy if you will uh, and, and they have a point of view they they are all whether it's a bill gates whether it is the uh, eric schmidt is very very nationalistic american uh, you know american kind of a almost right wing kind of a fever fervor he has but i would say more nationalistic beyond left or right uh, there are strong left wing uh, you know thinkers in this field and they have a lot of investments in in algorithms uh, there are strong christian there is a whole community called christianity and ai and 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 i'm participating in that there is a whole community called ai and faith uh, the latest issue of new york times magazine uh, the article was on uh, uh, you know on 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 uh, ai and god i mean what they were talking about is faith uh, what what how does ai interact with islamic point of view christian point of view uh you know jewish jewish point of view the vedic point of view has not been represented there and that is where i come in i'm trying to get in and represent a vedic point of view that we have a lot to say about ai and its biases and and we we need a seat at the table also but the problem i'm facing is that in india you do not have people interested in this topic you do not have people who even know about this topic i mean they are very dubious some some people think this must be some kind of a conspiracy theory this guy is talking about they are not taking the matter seriously and that that's a that's a concern of mine so the the to to conclude what i want to say is this india has not invested neither at the government level nor industry nor academic the the computer industry the ai industry has not invested in creating its own equivalent of gpt3 which would give us an engine an engine that is based on natural language processing that has our point of view that is that has studied all our texts all our shastras it has also looked at all the other philosophies and all the other points of view in the world but looked at it from our point of view we don't have such a machine we don't have such a device so we cannot we cannot sort of say that somebody else's algorithms have a problem and ours are superior in managing the discourse because we don't have such a capability what india is where is india headed in this this is not a pleasant uh, you know message to give but it has to be given especially since you are in in the business of theory and looking beneath the surface and interpreting things i have to give you this message and the message is this westerners mainly united states and also to some extent europe ha- are perfecting these algorithms that are controlling the social media and controlling the discourse and politics and what not and these these algorithms that they are controlling have some biases that are very sort of western oriented biases you might say that these algorithms are tools of colonization so ai is is recolonizing the world intellectually artificial intelligence and the recolonization of the world is a big topic in my book i have chapters on this book so you can read it i have chapters on the return of the east india company because the east india company was a private company like google is a private company and all, many of these are private companies but they got huge amount of power because they understand all your secrets they have been listening to you they have your data they have your private data and the machine learning is figuring you out it's saying that this guy is vulnerable to this this guy has these he likes these things he dislikes these things he's ideologically this way politically that way these are the these are the, the ways that he's compromised these are the skeletons in the closet that that could be exposed to and bring him down i mean the, the 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 algorithms know a whole lot about you you might be surprised how much the algorithms know about you in some ways they know even what you do unconsciously which you may not be aware of yourself Uh, big, uh, it may, uh, certainly the algorithms know more uh, more about you than your friends relatives even your very close people close uh, those, those who are very close to you so with algorithms able to keep track of billions of people and figure them out and manipulate them uh, it's a it's a very a very dangerous world that we are entering and india does not have its own investment india does not have its own investment in anything similar to gpt3 even though it's based on natural language processing and natural language processing started out with the study of panini panini is sanskrit grammar uh, 20 years ago 25 years ago 
my friends in uh, the sanskrit department at jnu the sanskrit department delhi university uh, in 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 varanasi in all these kind of places in pondicherry uh, were being flown to all the conferences on natural language processing because the the computer science people wanted to learn uh, the whole nlp field they wanted to learn uh, some, they wanted to learn uh, you know panini and uh, how to use those, that grammar uh, to translate languages from translate from one language to another uh, so the 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 field of computer science benefited a lot from uh, indian thought uh, in, in the early days and then it went beyond it went beyond on its own and now it now is pretty uh, uh, much uh, you know free to go go and keep extrapolating and expanding on its own uh, very rapidly so but india has been left behind uh, in, in in some indians in an individual capacity helped all this but they are left behind a very very large percentage of ai researchers in the world are indians but in a personal capacity they're not doing anything for india they're doing something for themselves they got a job they're doing something for themselves they're making good money i'm very proud of them very happy they they have big shots all over the place but that is not indian intellectual property that intellectual property belongs to google or it belongs to microsoft or it belongs to apple or whoever it belongs to somebody else it does not belong to india so india as such as an as an entity uh, does not have ownership of a whole lot of uh, uh, this kind of uh, ai technology and does not have its own capabilities to manage Uh, the social media and the intellectual discourse and the political discourse using algorithm as a weapon so if we are not able to do it uh, we are vulnerable to other people who are doing it so what's what's happening is all this technology is being imported into india and indians are getting colonized so the next generation of postmodernists uh, people who are postcolonialists people who are into gender studies people who are into you know social justice human rights the next generation of such people are going to be trained by and they are going to be taught how to use algorithms how to evaluate algorithms they will learn all the things that i'm telling you but those things which they will be taught will be with a bias will be with a western bias because that's where these things are being developed so you know if you look at who developed uh, who developed uh, uh, post colonial studies uh, who uh, where, where did uh, Uh, you know the, this or, this whole idea of orientalism and then post colonial studies and then subaltern studies and gender studies uh, then then uh, post modernism all the diff- what i call five waves the five waves of critical theory uh, applied to a uh, literary theory applied to india and indian culture are the five waves of indology i i i have written on five de- waves of indology written uh, works and given lectures and all that on it uh this is basically uh one wave of import after another uh, uh indians are basically just regurgitating parroting uh, uh you know what they read from uh, uh foreign uh, you know writers foreign thinkers so foreigners are the theory wallas the theory wallas in this field are foreign people they are the ones who come up with all these different kinds of uh, theories that you read Uh, and the indians are basically data wallers we supply case studies we supply examples uh, we supply sir in my neighborhood this happened they abuse this woman they abuse this caste wala i'll fill, fill it uh, supply it as my case study maybe i'll be sent on a plane ticket to somewhere uh, in a conference so basically indians in the field of literary theory and critical theory post modernism post colonial etc are applying western models to indian cases indian examples indian indian uh, case studies uh, but we are not creating our own theories uh, and now with the uh, advent of algorithms in ai the same thing is happening uh, these algorithms with their biases are being brought into india uh, and indians are absorbing them and simulating them uh, i won't name names but big companies big government people are involved in this in the sense of importing these ideas in the name of progress in the name of hey you know we are becoming very world class because we've now got this collaboration with google uh, not realizing that what we are really doing is inviting the east india company to come in and set up shop here that's what is going on so this is a very provocative statement i'm making that the 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 ai uh, is using postmodernism critical theory all of these kind of uh, these things as a window to get in and bring with it all the biases 
and it's a tsunami that's sweeping and a lot of the young people in in this field are mesmerized uh, but this is going to recolonize india uh, and 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 this, therefore this is my talk is more like hey guys let's wake up and do something i've written a whole book on it i'm i'm willing to st- uh, give workshops talk about it give have uh, q and a's uh, and i've had about 50 of these uh, uh you know discussions and q and a's uh, in the last uh, five or six months i would say and i'm willing to do more i'll stop there uh, i just want to provoke some young people so they can look into it and hope we can create a kind of made in india uh, ai with uh, made in india algorithms indian if there are going to be biases then we might as well have our biases because everybody has their biases the chinese have got their china biases Uh, there is no deconstruction of china's grand narrative they're putting their whole chinese grand narrative into ai and and implementing it uh, not only on chinese society but also exporting it to africa and exporting it to various other countries that they're trying to colonize so india as a player india has to become a player and we are not a player yet uh, the the future the the, the importance of the people in the, in the theory business in general is huge because either you'll get colonized and it'll be bad for india because you'll become the colonizers of the whole lot of indians uh, through all these theories that you bring in or you could be the you could be the 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 the, the home team that counters it you are educated you you know all this stuff you know the game and 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 ai could be a, a, a an opportunity for us to turn things around because it's still very new and and if we if we learn this and train our young people in this we may have a made in india position to counter all this and and become uh, become a true vishwa guru that we think we are so with that i will stop uh, i'll be happy to take any questions or or, or 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 either now or later on at some other point if you want to set up a q and a session uh, and i want to thank uh, i want to thank this the university you've done you are a great university uh, the mere fact that you are having conferences on uh, very broad uh big topics like this provocative topics like this is a good good sign and 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 i'm glad i got this opportunity to to uh, uh, to, re- to speak to especially your young people thank you very much thank you very much um dr uh, dr rajiv malhotra I, the, my name is raj kumar i'm the vice chancellor of pp jindal global university it is a indeed a proud privilege for me to listen to most of what you said Uh, and i also want to take this moment to invite all of you to the 7th jgu international literary conference on postmodernism time for reappraisal organized by the english literary society of op jindal global university i appreciate the presence of professor dr kapil kapoor chairman of the indian institute of advanced studies and of course uh, we heard mr malhotra founder of the infinity foundation uh, united states um I am a lawyer and a law professor by training. Uh, most of my educational uh, training has been in the field of law, and of course, for the last eleven years uh, since the very founding of this university, I have been the vice chancellor of this university. And what I can say from what I heard, but also the larger uh, thematic framework of this conference is the importance of dialogue and discourse on. these issues that mr malhotra spoke had spoken about uh, i think it is only fair to say that uh, the kind of discussions and debates that ought to happen in universities need to be promoted and promoted more uh, vigorously uh, i want to take this moment to compliment the work of dr batra as well as uh, dr gopa nayak and other members of the english literary society for taking this effort to organize the international literary conference it's uh, grown from strength to strength the university itself is only 11 years old and to have the 7th jgu international literary conference speaks volumes about the passion the commitment and the dedication of our faculty and staff in this regard i also want to mention that uh, it is my proud privilege to formally inaugurate the conference i know that uh, i got delayed because of another event uh, we have just been in the process of having the world university summit for the last 3 days which itself has witnessed 
over 150 thought leaders, over 100 vice chancellors and presidents and rectors of universities around the world uh, from 25 plus countries in six different continents. It was inaugurated by the Honorable Vice President of India and the Union Education Minister, as well as the, the Chairman of the University Grants Commission. And we've had intense debates and discussions on a range of issues that are affecting the future of universities in the world. The kind of speakers that have come together uh, and the uh, thematic sessions that are being uh, held in the next few days uh, will provide immense uh, food for thought, but also uh, will end up becoming a repository of uh, knowledge and perspectives that will be useful not only for researchers and faculty members, but also for students uh, to be able to have a better understanding and appreciation of the impact of these issues in the future. With those words, I once again want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are present and are indeed participating in the 7th JGU International Literary Conference. Uh, I deem it a great pleasure to declare the conference open and to uh, wish the conference and the people and the proceedings every success. Thank you. Throw a question, shoot questions at me. Now you can please relate the questions. Yeah, especially, especially questions that are difficult questions. I love to answer those. Sure. Sir. Right, the difficult sure. ones. Can I ask? <laughs> no, the first one, please. Yes. Would you like to ask yourself? Yes, sir. I have a question for Sir. Uh, Sir, as you said that artificial intelligence is kind of colonizing uh, the third world. Uh, after colonization, there started decolonization. And after decolonization, uh, we experienced the third world experienced neocolonization. Neocolonization here, I mean, kind of cultural colonization, culture of uh, uh, colonizing through economy, colonizing through uh, lifestyle. And that is neocolonization. Can we call artificial intelligence as one part of neocolonization in the third world from the Western part? Uh, you see, artificial intelligence is as fundamental as the industrial revolution. Uh, the, the industrial revolution in England a couple hundred years ago is what turned it into a colonizer. Without the industrial revolution, it did not have the economic might to colonize the world and and make India a colony and so on. So it is. Uh, it was the power of the industry which they had, and nobody else had this this industrial revolution for a while. And and then France also had it. So they both became colonizers. I see artificial intelligence as the new industrial revolution. It's being called the fourth industrial revolution, uh, and it's probably more dramatic and bigger impact than the previous industrial revolutions. So this industrial revolution is creating haves and have-nots colonizer and colonized. Uh, it's going to decide who are the, who are the uh, very rich, super rich people and who are the very poor people. There is more poor people than ever before. And the amount of uh, equity, amount of, uh, uh, amount of income and wealth owned by the bottom 50% as a percentage of total world wealth is lower than before. And the amount of wealth owned by the top 1% uh, uh, is more than ever before. So, you know, the, 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 the big uh, gap uh, and the polarization is happening worse than ever before. So it is not unfair to say that this is the return of the East India Company. Uh, this is the return and there are a lot of uh, zamindars in India. I call them zamindars. In my book, I call them zamindars. They are the zamindars who are bringing all this new uh, stuff, new, the new East India companies, which are these AI-oriented kind of uh, people. They're bringing them into India, making money as the middleman because the middleman always makes money, okay? And so they like, just like the zamindars and the babus, there are a lot of economy for them. We have a lot of new babus uh, in this AI economy where, the, where the, the, the new East India companies are these mostly American companies. They were also Chinese companies, we got rid of them. Uh, but there were like six major American companies, three major Chinese companies controlling this whole thing. And besides that, American, big American companies, a lot of middle tier, third tier companies that are all involved in this big ecosystem. So what you have to look at is a very gigantic thing happening, as big as the industrial revolution and the colonization of the world. We are, we are returning to that and, and it's going to happen in a very powerful way, much bigger scale. 
and our people don't know this this is our job this is your job my job to awaken these people imagine if somebody when the industrial revolution was getting started could know, understand what the consequences will be and could go around everywhere and educate people and make them whereas people in places like india thought that these guys are bringing us machine made things those machine made things are superior to what we can make and we'll buy them so the whole economy of the world shifted to this industrial economy from the from the from england and france is what happened now you are fine i'm fine i i'm i'm telling you that the same industry the same ai based industrialization new kind of industrialization new kind of economy knowledge economy information economy media economy including control of politics just like the just like the east india company controlled indian politics through the rajas they gave the raja put him on a elephant and give him a gun salute and send his son to play polo with some, pe some people in england in cambridge they did all that and the same thing is happening now the this the the the, the they have taken indians to uh, incorporated indians into their system some of these indians are ceo here ceo there so we feel very proud that we must be safe because our indian bhai is sitting there ahead of google or head of microsoft but he is actually an individual employee who become very rich on his own there's nothing wrong with that but i don't think that he's working for us he's working for his employer he, 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 you know sundar pichai is not working for india he's working for google that it's very clear to that and when sundar pichai says artificial intelligence is more fundamental breakthrough than electricity more fundamental breakthrough than the industrial revolution he's absolutely right and uh, the point is that where are we where is india in all this has india taken care of itself so i would say that while the terminology of neo colonialism that has been around is applicable but ai is so big and so unique we need we need people who understand how algorithms are created how they become so smart the importance of big data you know india is supplying the two raw materials needed to make ai and yet this ai belongs to some other people first raw material is brains india is the largest exporter of brains which are being used by all these western countries and western uh, foreign people to make their things using indian brains but these indian brains don't own any equity it's like the bricklayer from uh, poor village in bihar comes to delhi and he makes a house for a rich man but at the end when he's done he doesn't own one brick even he doesn't own equity in one brick he's just given his labor so the same way our lab our uh, 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 tech people are laborers i call them ai coolies tech coolies that they are doing all the all the hard work uh, and they don't own the, the the fruits of the labor the second input is big data a large amount of data is needed for the machines to be trained and india is a very large source of diversity and hence a very large source of big data but we have not used our own big data for our own technology we do not own the intellectual property that can be made by combining our brains and our data we are exporting the brains and we are giving away for free the data this is what's happening right now and niti ayog is not taking care of our situation niti ayog invites google and mckinsey and these kind of people to develop their strategy because they are not able to develop their own strategy so because they're not they haven't studied these issues deep enough and i've gone i've given away copies of my book i've talked to these people i've encouraged them i want them to come out and have q and a and discussions they're not interested because they want to just ignore all this and they are so closely aligned with the contemporary east india company equivalent it's quite scary so i'm glad that you raised this question thank you sir thank you very much uh, it is much clear to me it is really clear there is another uh, question me? coming up Could from you... uh, professor c r v rao former vice chancellor and uh, rao sir may i ask you to kindly unmute yourself and ask your question uh, thank you dr rajiv malhotra for a for an excellent uh, lecture very illustrative very profound in its thought content and very right in its approach that uh, indian cultural system should be taken into account in the creating of an artificial intelligence that informs people uh, that develops a public discourse for the benefit of society but then my question is uh, this is there a unified concept of indian culture that can form the nexus for the creation of an algorithm for artificial intelligence does it not therefore in the absence of a unified concept of indian culture 
would it not lead to the creation of a public discourse based on, again, a certain kind of colonized perspective within the nation? You know, you are so brilliant. You are so absolutely right on. The, the, my theme has always been, uh, we need an Indian grand narrative. We need an Indian, Indian uh, uh, you know, ecosystem uh, in which we can accommodate all the, all the communities of India. Uh, we can accommodate the Muslims, the Christians, the, the, you know, the people who are atheists, uh, Hindu people, Sikhs, Buddhists, all of these, all the different diversity, languages, North, South, whatever. Uh, we, need a, we need an Indian grand narrative and I've tried very hard to develop my own ideas in this regard, to get other people involved, to get government, Ministry of Culture involved, did not succeed, um, get some gurus involved, did not succeed, uh, get various think tanks involved, universities involved, maybe this university will join in. But, but I have not been able to create, a, a, I mean, it's not a good idea for one man to put out his own grand narrative idea. It has to be a collective process, because as you said, if, uh, if the, people keep writing to me and saying, why don't you publish your book? Well, my book is ready, but that is my book. I want it to be a collective effort. I want, uh, I want uh, uh, people to come together. So it is our shared narrative because that's how it is. And we have to negotiate, exchange ideas. So these are some of the, there are some ethoses that are very important Indian ethoses, uh, uh, which allow us to have a discussion and create this uh, unified narrative. If we had created this narrative over the last 25, 30 years, like I wanted to, we would be ready for this AI challenge. We would have our own uh, narrative uh, uh, in, in the, uh, you know, uh, as the foundation for all these algorithms, but we don't. And you're absolutely right. What is going to happen now is I'm predicting this will happen. The, these Western narratives are already into the algorithms and they are, and they're, you know, uh, Ambani is, uh, invaded with all the Google stuff and Facebook stuff because those people put tens of billions of dollars in it into the into the company. Uh, all the Indian companies are kind of looking for American collaboration and money and technology and algorithms come with it. Uh, there are certain movements. I, I don't want to disclose that right at this point in time because I'm writing about it. There are certain there are certain global movements that India has joined officially at the government level and at the industry level big movements with an official uh, power structure that Indians have joined, thinking we are joining a kind of an, a level playing field, but it is not a level playing field. Uh, uh, what we have joined are is an algorithmic world with a lot of biases in it. And these biases are against our civilization. These biases are against our civilization. So all the fighting people are doing that there is bias in Rutgers, there's bias with Soros, George Soros, there's bias against uh, in the Twitter. All those are fighting the symptoms. You are not fighting the root problem. The root problem is we do not have our own shared narrative and we do not have the technology to put it, put it in. We neither have the soft uh, item, which is the narrative, nor the hard item, which is the technology to put it in. We don't have that. China has all of that. China has their narrative and they are top in the technology neck to neck with US. US has their technology and they have the right, their right wing uh, narrative, their left wing narrative, they got their narratives there. European Union is developing it. Russia is developing this. Uh, Japan is developing this. Even a small country like uh, Israel is, ha ha is having its own cell phone. India does not. So in this new age of uh, uh, the new era, the new epoch, of uh, a new industrial revolution with AI as the engine driving it uh, and, and all this content, uh, this uh, content of different cultures and civilizations embedded, hidden inside it, structures hidden inside it that you have to tease out and deconstruct. In this new epoch, uh, India is not in the top tier, which is USA and China fighting like England and France were fighting for uh, within the, in, the, in the industrial revolution in India, England and France were fighting over colonies and who will become, who will control and they had wars with each other. Today, that role of England and uh, versus France is actually US versus China. That is tier one. Tier two are these other powers that will be okay. They may not be world powers, but they will not be taken over. They will neither be colonizers, not colonized. Maybe Russia, maybe Japan, maybe Israel. <laughs> maybe Europe, France, all these people. India is not even at the second tier. We are, where are we? So this is a very serious matter. And I, I, I have just sent an email to uh, 
uh, Professor Bhattraji, please send me the, the proceedings of this conference you had on AI and ancient India. I wish somebody had told me about it. This, my whole book is on that. Uh, and, and, and this is what I spent the last 10 years studying. Uh, but I want to understand uh, how far they are, what are they thinking, who are these guys, what are their points of view. Uh, this is a very important conversation we should have. So what uh, Professor Rao has done is extremely important. He's taken the issue I've raised, he's taken it to the next level and said, how do we solve this? It's not that easy. And you know, the government doesn't understand. I mean, I've been through three or four HRD ministers, one after the other, and after, mm -hmm. since the time of Kapil Sibyl, talking to them, Murli Manor Joshi. I've had so many discussions, given hundreds of PowerPoint slides, this and that, but, you know, at the end of the day, I got tired. I said, you know, India is not ready. India just want to receive what the Americans are giving them. Uh, the the Niti Aayog is rather, rather develop a, a strategic plan on AI, uh, quoting uh, Google here and there and quoting what McKinsey wrote and whatnot. But we don't have our own research. You see, it, our people have not even studied the impact of AI on India our own way. We have taken the McKinsey report and, the, and this... Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, you know, this uh, uh, World Economic Forum report uh, and some report from Oxford uh, uh, Economics, and we've taken reports from uh, Harvard and some from, uh, you know, uh, Ernst, Ernst and Young and these kind of people. Their reports we've taken, uh, and and we've uh, quoted from those reports. Uh, that is what the Niti Aayog work is, and the CII people and the NASCOM people who are the keepers of Indian technology. They're also just basically quoting these American reports. So Indian Indians haven't even done our own Purva Paksha about this. We need haven't done Purva Paksha. I'm starting the Purva Paksha of AI, Western AI, as a, as a colonizing force. So what has to happen is this. Every state should do a research project on what's the impact of AI in the state economy. It is not uh, enough to do top-down, high-level, how it will affect the industry in Bombay and all that. Every state is going to be affected. Every industry should look at what will happen to our industry. We, uh, what is going to happen to the automobile industry? There are a few million people working in the India's automobile industry. India's automobile industry is going to be wiped out because this new, this new technology will not be using the same carburetor and spark plug and the kind of uh, products and the parts that our people are making are obsolete. It's a matter of time where this kind of economy is going to squeeze and a lot of people will lose their jobs. So, you know, we are sleeping. The, we, the, 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 the leaders who ought to be keeping up at night, worrying about it, thinking about it, are not doing their job. And, and that, is something, that is something I'm glad that Dr. Rao mentioned. Abina Habib, are you there? She says, uh, uh, please, could you give me some example as to how the AI is biased against Indianness? That se there seems to be a problem in understanding it, unless you give some concrete example. So uh, the, the current fights going on against uh, Twitter, uh, uh, where we feel that uh, Twitter is uh, Twitter's not taking responsibility for misleading content for false content for biased content uh, yeah. that's an example uh, there are many examples where the map of india shows certain parts of india is not being part of india and these are part of the uh, part of the part of these systems digital systems and they are worldwide that's an example uh, if you take a if you take a position on caa and you say okay government position is the official position the official position on 370 and CAA and whatever farmers bill, if you, if you were to consider that to be the benchmark of what is India's position, because it's a democracy, it's a democratically elected government, I may not agree with it, but that's the position of India, like every democratically elected country has its position. The fight against these in the algorithms is very serious. The algorithms are certainly biased. If I put out a, if I put out an, a, a, a discourse dumping all this, attacking all this, my, I will get 10 times, 50 times more views. They'll make sure of that. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm arguing against them, all my, all my uh, talks uh, criticizing these people as the new East India company, they all get flagged. So I'm, I'm an example. You, 
my videos are an example. I have a large amount of uh, uh, instances where I'm being notified that you better stop this and you better change that. And we argue, we argue. And sometimes we convince the human beings that this algorithm is biased. The, the human beings working at uh, Google often agree with us and disagree with their own algorithm, but the algorithm they are not able to override because that requires a very high level person. So these, the, the algorithmic bias on what is the nature of caste? Is caste a Hindu problem? Is caste a historical problem? Is it a cultural issue? Is it a more modern issue? Did it emerge from the Vedic times or did it emerge as a result of historical events that happened later? That's a point of discussion. But the, the position taken by these algorithms is not something that, the, that the, 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 a lot of people in India would support. Uh, the, the positions taken in these, uh, in these algorithms have come from Western Indologists. It's people sitting in Harvard and, and uh, Chicago and uh, Berkeley uh, who are close to whose papers and whose research work uh, feeds the, the training of these algorithms. So the algorithmic uh, bias against Indian culture is huge. It's, uh, uh, if you are on social media, you will see these fights every single day. Uh, why, why is a person uh, who is saying, I am a proud Hindu, uh, considered chauvinist, saffron, just for being a proud Hindu, whereas a person who says, I'm a proud Christian, the algorithms don't flag him because Joe Biden is a proud Christian and so is, a, uh, so is a Trump. I mean, they're, they're Democrats and uh, Republicans, whoever they, who, whichever side you go, they've never denied their faith. They don't have to deny their faith to be legitimate, to be secular. They don't have to say, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm against the majority religion of this country. Nobody would survive in the United States politically if he took that position. But in India, it is required. It, 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 so this kind of, what is politically correct? What is going to be, uh, what is the definition of human rights? Who decides human rights? I mean, all the fights that are going on against amnesty, uh, that is part of this whole thing. The, the, the views of uh, certain international agencies, uh, certain uh, international think tanks, uh, certain governments, uh, certain media and social media, those are the views that are very dominant on Indian culture. I mean, this is a, the, the, the reason people are saying, why don't we have a proper uh, NCRT books? And why is his Indian history so biased? I mean, that all of that is part of what I'm talking about. AI, AI merely is a force multiplier. AI is a force multiplier. AI does not create new biases. Whatever biases exist, it amplifies them. So if there are gender biases, it will amplify them. If there are biases against blacks, it will amplify them. So the whatever the bias, bias wars, the discourse wars are going on in India right now, AI is basically amplifying that. So if, if, if the, since the AI is owned and controlled by people on one side and not people on the other side, that is where the bias comes from. Uh, there's a question uh, from Dr. Rashmi Bajaj. I invite her to put her question here. Dr. Rashmi, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Good evening, everybody here. Wonderful conference. Great beginning with Rajiv Malhotraji's address to all of us. Yes, this artificial intelligence and then, you know, the Indian scholarship. The big problem here is that very little native Indian or the Indian scholarship as such exists. Whatever exists and whatever is famous or reputed or has international reputation, that is all leftist only, leftist only. In that case, what scope do you see for Indian scholarship to make or create a space in artificial intelligence? Because anything Hindu, anything Vedic, is such a big, you know, that is such a big allergic thing, that is such an anathema, then what scope you say, think there is for creating that kind of space for Vedic or say something really intrinsically Indian? Very, very important question. So artificial intelligence can be our, it can finish us off and we can be dead because of the, it's like somebody, we are fighting with bows and arrows and somebody has got cannons. You know, Babur brought cannons to India land on the land for the first time. There were never cannons before. And that began a whole, you know, you it, it started a whole epoch in Indian history because somebody else owned the weapons. We did not own the weapons. And uh, the Portuguese brought them uh, 
uh, the Europeans brought these uh, uh, cannons on ships for the first time. So the land and the ship sea route to bring cannons into India, into South Asia happened with foreigners doing it. And we did not control these things. We had the metallurgy, we had all the technology, we not, didn't put it together ourselves. So you see, that's what's happening with AI. And that'll be a very big devastation for India. However, India can also be the person, if we start developing this cannon before Babur comes and brings it, and we develop our cannon, then it will be the other way around. And there is no reason we cannot develop this cannon. We got the manpower who are brilliant people. We got the big data. Uh, you know, we don't have the hardware. We, India does not have the semiconductors. The semiconductor is, industry is gigantically is galloping ahead because AI gobbles up a lot of hardware and speed and quantum computing. So, you know, there are multiple technologies that are needed to fight this race and a lot of money is needed, a lot of brains are needed. So if India were to create a pro-India algorithmic uh, AI system and teach it to our teachers, school teachers, uh, teach Indian history through these algorithms, the Indian education system should be automated with all of this stuff. And, and uh, universities teaching courses using our machine learning, uh, uh, you know, our algorithms with our point of view, then, you know, then we'll be, we'll be not only countering it, we'll be actually on the offensive. Uh, India should have something like a GPT-3. Look up what GPT-3 is. And there are equivalents. There's Google Brain. There's China has started uh, something they announced in the last couple of months, which is even bigger than all this. India should have something of that kind. Okay. And, and in that, think of it like a super brain, AI kind of a brain. And in that, you put in the content, our content, I don't mind if we put in uh, left-wing content, right-wing content, but it should be Indian. I don't mind you put in the content of all the religions of India, but it should be pro-India. I mean, you should get uh, uh, Muslims who are, I call them Swadeshi Muslims, get Swadeshi Muslims, put in the Swadeshi Muslim point of view, and you get Christian, you get all, you get all the faiths of India, all the points of view of India, and create a, a kind of a multifaceted open system, open architecture with many points of view, but they should be very much locked into patriotism, into the sovereignty of India, into the respect for the Indian Rashtra. Certain, build, certain common denominators should exist among all the people who are, call themselves Indian, regardless of how much they fight each other. You know, this is the beauty in America. They'll fight all kind of stuff, but they'll all say they're all subscribed to something called American exceptionalism. So you should look at what is meant by American exceptionalism. What is the history of this idea? Uh, what does it mean to be that America is the exceptional country of the world? It is supported by the left, by the right, by you know whether you are whether you are uh, uh, you know Jimmy Carter, the most left-wing president in recent years, but born again Christian. Uh, whether you are uh, you know whoever, whether you are Biden, again same story, a very liberal left-wing, but very solid Catholic. No, pr very proud of it. The point is that the, the Indians lost pride in selfhood because of colonization. So we don't have that, uh, uh, as, as, as Rashmiji is saying, you know, the, our narrative is being defined by other people. For 25 years, I've been saying, India is the largest civilization, largest cultural matrix and civilization whose narrative is controlled from the outside. You know, this is not true of any other big country. Maybe some small little country in Africa or Latin America, they have a similar problem. But they are tiny country. For a large country like India, we have outsourced, we have outsourced the study of India to the hands of other people. And when this, when we do set up a Ashoka University, it is still colonized people who come and run it. The, 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 the kind of people who come and run Ashoka University are worse than JNU. And so the, the, the problem of... Uh, uh, controlling our own discourse has not happened correctly. I have tried to do conferences in India. My foundation, Infinity Foundation, done many conferences in India where we wanted to bring in people from left, right, everywhere, put them together and try to create a kind of an Indian, uh, you know, Indian narrative. But the point is, the moment one Westerner comes, one person from Europe comes, everybody goes and looks at this guy as God and he, what he tells you must be true. And who is this Rajiv fellow? He's one of us, brown-skinned fellows. He's gone to America, but maybe just ultimately he's one of us only. 
but this guy is a real thing because he's the real is a is a real american you look at him how he is and all so our people got this inferiority complex and, and, and with the people who got this inferiority complex uh, you know we are not we are not able to be self empowered and so this is becoming very dangerous in this age of algorithms as the problem has been there and our people understand it and there is a lot of fight going on about this but now the algorithms take it to a new level so uh... Can I ask uh, Dr. Shruti Jain now to come up with her question? And uh, Dr. Gopa Naik is here. I'd also request her to say a few words after this because uh, you know the program has been a little uh, different now than it was envisaged to be. So I'll ask her to be ready with her comment after this. Dr. Shruti, please. Um, thank you so much, Rajivji. I have been following you. Uh, for a long time, I, I do follow your videos. I I understand what you um, what your message is, right? The spirit is so perfect. I mean, I now I am a, an associate professor. I'm talking about myself. Let's let's begin like this. Who has studied um, sociologists who are Western? Who has studied um, Indian about India through Indian? thinkers like Sri Aurobindo or say Muhammad Iqbal who have been influenced by the West again. I still think there is a lot to learn from them too. Um, this is very interesting. It's a, it's a very interesting ping pong between the East and West. Um, my, my, my research has been on, on the philosophy, on a comparative philosophy, on the reception of Nietzsche in India. And um, that kind of gave me an insight into the kind of appropriations that have been done in, in order to understand India as well. But likewise, Indians also did not really understand the West the way it have been understood, for example. So this is interesting how it goes both ways. You know, how what would you like to say there? And my problem is always, you know, when we keep saying, Indian culture, Indian culture. Well, my India is different from yours. And I think you actually said, said it in one of, while you're explaining it, you did say that we need to have a shared um, collective conscious um, uh, narrative. Um, but still, I think um, the second part of Professor Rao's question kind of um, was not taken into consideration because there is a possibility of, um, you know, um, the colonized perspective only, which is not so good, I feel. Uh, so let me just uh, respond in, because you may mention many things. Firstly, first, Nietzsche, Nietzsche is a very interesting character and was influenced a lot by Buddhism and that has not been properly uh, attributed. Uh, I, have a, I have 20 books that are uh, being written uh, for many, many years and I keep putting out one or two here and there, but, uh, but I have many books in parallel. One of them is on Buddhist influences on Western thought, which go way back in time. Before the colonial era uh, started, uh, the Buddhist influences had, were there. And uh, the, the Buddhist influences through a whole lot of mechanisms went uh, into different parts, of Germ uh, different parts of Europe, especially Germany. So the, Purv, the, the, the thing we need to do is what is the, our tradition calls the Purva Paksha, study of the other. And you are, you are pointing out correctly that we do not have our own authentic view of, of the West. We don't have our authentic view of China. We do not have our view of the other because we, the, our, the view we have of uh, Western thought is a Western view. You know, we have the, the criticism we do of America is the American's own criticism. Uh, if, you, if you look at, if you go to American studies in JNU, they're reading American authors about writing about America those who are writing for it and those who are writing against it, those who are left wing, those who are writing, they're all only Americans only. And so we are reading and regurgitating that as Professor Batra said, that we are basically recycling, uh, you know, Western thought. So this is a, this is a very deep problem. Uh, th and this is a problem where, you know, you've got to change thinking right from childhood onwards. It is not something that uh, people who are raised. I, I have so much time arguing uh, uh, with people who, consider themselves to be very solidly in our tradition, very patriotic, culturally very much on our, uh, you know, on our wavelength. But when you scratch the surface, beneath the surface, they don't have any knowledge. They think of the Aryan invasion theory as some kind of gospel. I mean, they really have colonial constructs 
incorporated into them like apps have been downloaded and these are very hard to get rid of so you know the the problem the problem that uh, professor rao mentioned and the problem that you mentioned which is that uh, india because because the center the, the, there always have to be a, a center of the narrative and then you can hang many different things around it but there has to be a center that people agree to and so that center we don't have it's like a vacuum and this vacuum is being filled by foreign forces breaking india forces from here there colonized forces and so on we don't have it and th this is not something that can be created overnight it should not be created by one person it requires a process it requires a lot of funding this is nation building this this narrative building is nation building and we haven't started this the the nation building that was started by gandhi and continued by the congress party had some had a lot of good things in it tremendous amount of good things in it and it could have been expanded to include voices that they had left out but you know that had gone into politics that got into corruption and that fell apart and now that is disabused and that is sort of considered no good people people don't want it anymore so we we are back to uh, we are where uh, gandhi when he started writing hind swaraj his book hind swaraj in the early 1900s was the first attempt to write about to to propose an indian narrative that book was and, and some some of the people earlier earlier than that also in the late 1800s had been doing that kind of work we really haven't taken that project up we haven't taken that project of narrative building as nation building forward we have conference here conference there people come they talk they do this but this is not a, something that you can do one conference to the next you need a permanent organization you need a permanent think tank you need scholars who are very seriously committed to it and i'm sorry to say we just don't have it and and you know uh, i tried my best when i was young guy i try, I, i gave up everything to try and build it and now i'm 70 plus i'm not going to uh, start anything new at this stage i'm not going to fight any uh, go around uh, begging people to uh, you know give support and all that i done my bit and and there are lots of people like you who have been influenced and now it's for you to take it forward so i i i have to say basically uh, shruti ji the answer to these questions has to come from people like you because i've done what i could and i i can tell you what has not worked in india there are too many camps too many people who are looking for political success for the next election uh, they're just looking for the next election and what can you do to get me votes and make me win in the next election please tell me that otherwise i have no time for you that sort of mentality is there and uh, india india as such the rashtra the rashtra as such is not being looked after you know there's a difference between rashtra and rajya in the rigved in all the vedas and uh, the rashtra rashtrapati is not supposed to be political not supposed to be rajyapati rajya is a political governance uh, it it's in the service of the rashtra but the rashtra is a very strong long term you know vision it's a grand narrative rashtra is a grand narrative so who are the keepers of this grand narrative and this grand narrative cannot be oh, we have done we did this 100 years ago or 50 years ago the grand narrative has to be future oriented the rashtra keepers of the rashtra the rashtrapatis have to be ai savvy because this is the next uh, industrial revolution so this this kind of uh, this kind of discourse and stuff that i'm talking about should be embraced at the highest levels but i didn't not only i didn't get any calls or anybody uh, wanting to listen to this even me knocking at the door one door after another after another people are very polite they'll give you tea they'll give, invite you to dinner they listen to you they're very very nice and hospitable courteous but at the end of the day they're not doing anything because i think people have people have become very short term jugaad me and mine and now and i and that and, and what is very long term and may may not be good for me personally nobody is it, it's sort of like an orphan that is uh, so india's uh, india's real self food sovereignty uh, intellectual discourse is not in in a secure position right now and 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 uh, this is this is a matter of concern i have thank you sir uh, violeta from russia also actually echoes your words when she says that uh, russia has its own narrative it has uh, some kind of exceptionalism uh, kind of thing but then it is not like america 
and there's too much of difference of opinion here also. Now, Vyanita, are you there? Would you like to say it yourself? Yeah, please, come on, come on, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, say a big thank you to Professor Malotra for his brilliant talk and his discussion because uh, it has just made me think a lot about our Russian situation, which may seem from outside that we have such a kind of a grand narrative uh, promoted uh, by, by our president. But uh, actually, if we uh, take the situation inside, we have the same uh, great variety of opinions and great variety of people that are very difficult to make hear each other. Uh, I'm one of the people who try to hear different ideas, though I do have my own, uh, of course, but uh, there are people that uh, are very different to make uh, hear each other. So I think you uh, do a great job indeed for your country. And uh, I do think uh, this topic of artificial intelligence and the question of power and the question of influence and colonization, uh, all these issues are very, very important. And we also need to think about them here in Russia and uh, to uh, make a discussion uh, on them. So just a big thank you for your talk. I'm, I'm more than happy to participate in more of these discussions. Uh, maybe maybe one involving Russia and maybe involving other other uh, topics also. And uh, one more, I just noticed uh, Professor R. Sudarshan, who is Dean of uh, Jindal School of Governance and Public Policy, is here. And he has also written something here. I request him to kindly come alive here and uh, put in his comment. Professor Sudarshan, please, are you there? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for um, no, I, you know, I, I've been fascinated listening to this discussion because, you know, some, um, you know, uh, in the last week of May, the UN system in India and the School of Government and Public Policy were under B, we organized a conference on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And the motivation for yeah. this was that everything that's been done by way of regulating artificial intelligence, you know, concerns about privacy and uh, humanity and uh, self-worth and all of that have all been influenced by a narrow spectrum of Western philosophy, uh, largely utilitarian, you know, the greatest good of the greatest number, not, and not differentiating between what is the right thing to do and what is good for business, right? So we wanted to bring in alternative perspectives. Um, and we invited uh, the, the Professor Raji Malhotra for this by going through the contact page in um, the website of the foundation, but we didn't get a response from him. So I was very disappointed. And then fortunately for us, one of our speakers, we had a number of speakers speaking to Confucianism, Buddhism, um, Advaita, uh, was uh, Sarvapriya Nanda. And what he did at the start of his presentation was to hold up uh, uh, Professor Malhotra's book, which in fact I have a copy of and which I read, and summarized it briefly, right? But we missed him. So uh, now we want to, now I feel envious uh, that you are able to get him from our university and I couldn't. Um, and so I want to organize another conference on this, on the, on the, how will regulatory frameworks, uh, you know, public policy frameworks, how should they be informed by perspectives coming from uh, our philosophies, not, not the Western philosophies, but, you know, the, our philosophies in terms of whether it's Vedanta or Buddhism or Confucianism, you know, whatever it is, we need to explore it. But instead of just imitating, you know, regulatory frameworks that Facebook and um, you know, Twitter themselves create for themselves as if they are great, uh, outstanding ethical guardians of our privacy. We need to question this. We need to question what is this 
what is this phenomenon artificial intelligence how do we approach it from a perspective that is ours yes and, and so this this is what i wish to do next and i'm very thrilled that um, you, you had this um, you know in the literary conference um, you know professor rajiv malhotra um, speaking and uh, sharing his views first of all i want to thank uh, yes, sir. professor sudarshan for his comments uh, i i want to apologize but i want to give you a reason may 25th i had a very serious surgery that this is the first public appearance i have made since my surgery uh, and 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 i apologize that i didn't get back and uh, my team should have gotten back somebody should have gotten back uh, because there were other people who were supposed to be uh, looking at this stuff uh, if uh, if uh, professor sudarshan has another event i would love it i would love to be part of it uh, i would love to uh, give shape to this discussion uh, that uh, professor sudarshan uh, sorry for what happened but you invite me and do another one and we will we will do it but one last quick comment from professor prabhat patabendi from sri lanka who is a founding director of uh, international center for research and development he has just sent his message a quick comment from you sir professor patabendi he is uh, speaking from canada and is up at this hour probably 1 o'clock over there good morning good morning uh, from toronto Hi. canada uh, professor malhotra it's a very fruitful discussion about indianness i learned a lot about how india helps prosper america through producing tech people including canada last week indian foreign ministry has requested global affairs canada to clear visa issues for 33000 indian students to come to canada so it's canada's gain and uh, your people you say mother india but it seems to me after hearing your discussions now for indians america is great that's that's my that's my conclusion like for america is great for indians now that's america's gain india is losing but we can never say mother sri lanka is very rarely say yeah no people say mother india but now it <laughs> america is great for you guys so it's very good so, so, yeah. so you know so you know uh, uh, mother india mother india does not mean that uh, that we cannot learn from others uh, because the tradition of purva paksha is meant for that the tradition of purva paksha says you understand others including those you don't disagree that you don't agree with you study them you learn them you you get to know them as well as they know themselves maybe even better and then you 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 pick up the good things that you can and incorporate them in fact indians were very good at that uh, adi shankara debate with buddhists and debate uh, debate with the, the different kind of uh, uh, you know traditions uh, uh, he he, he picked up a lot a lot of uh, arguments and logic Uh, there is a lot of interaction cross flow between the buddhist madhyamik buddhism and and vedantins they learning from each other and then the different systems of vedanta debating each other uh, disagreeing but also picking up ideas learning from each other uh, indians were always good at taking uh, taking something that we have and then incorporating other things from other people to make it even better if you look at the if you look at city the the the, the, the civil engineering Uh, and the technology in the indus saraswati civilization it is not static it's constantly learning so indians are not static people and therefore to learn from the greatness of america america has got greatness in it america has got horrible things in it uh, uh, america has got all of these things china has got some great things we can learn from china has got some horrible things uh, uh, you know so i would say that we should not become insulated uh, from the rest of the world we should not become a sort of uh, Uh, i in arrogance become like okay we have nothing to gain we why do you want to talk to you we should be like china in the sense as far as us is concerned us relations are concerned china sent lakhs of people to united states to study but more than 95% of them went back india sends a large number of people to united states most of them don't come back there's a difference you know china picked up all this knowledge they they in fact stole a lot of technology they sent there <laughs> i'm not suggesting that but they send their people to go infiltrate every kind of organization get jobs learn and bring the secrets back and so the chinese said why why not uh, learn from these americans whatever they have done good stuff they done we'll pick it up 
So the whole manufacturing system, the whole system of uh, artificial intelligence they've learned from America, the machine learning, quantum computing they've learned, semiconductors they've learned, they have, so their idea is that, yes, we will learn the greatness of America, bring it back and make it Chinese. We not done that. We have, we have basically sold out our people said, okay, go to America, study, live there, just send us your money, just send us your repatriation. Uh, the the mm -hmm. ministry of, uh, you know, looking at PIOs and all that, all it cares about how they measure success is how much repatriation we're getting. So I would say mother India should engage America. It should engage Russia. It should engage China. It should engage Europe, Canada, all of that. But it should engage with people who have been trained, who have been indoctrinated. So when these people go, they're not sort of lost. They're not looking for, they're not in awe. I mean, they should hold their ground as, as a people of a great civilization and be yet be able to engage and, 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 and deal with and, and debate with the other side. So the, 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 uh, the love, the, 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 the appreciation of American greatness is not a bad thing because there are great qualities, but that should not be, it's not a zero sum game. It should not be at the cost of uh, feeling inferior and uh, uh, you know, lack of confidence and, and inferiority complex. It should not be like that. So that's the way I, I look at it. Thank you very much, sir. It was wonderful listening to you and you combine in yourself, you know, the latest in scientific knowledge around the world with the, the classical and ancient best kind of knowledge that we have in India. So may I now call upon Professor Gopanayak to thank formally our chief guest. Professor Gopanayak, please. Good evening, everyone. And thank you. Um, uh, Rajivji for coming here. In fact, when I heard that you are coming, I mean, my joy knew no bounds. And I agree with Professor Sudarshan that uh, you, you, I mean, the discussion with you is going to be very fruitful for the university because we are a university which believes in bringing in this. And Professor Sudarshan is kind of uh, pioneered this when bringing in the linguistic plurality and the uh, whatever you call, whether it's religious um, harmony. And uh, with relation to uh, the uh, Dr. Pravnath's question, you know, uh, Rajivji has always believed that Vasudeva Kutumbakam uh, is the attitude. We are not averse to foreign for foreigners, but we want our place on the table. That's yeah. what the Indians want. And perhaps Rajivji has been fighting for this. Uh, and that is perhaps lacking in India because we uh, give place to many ideas. And when I give many place to many ideas, I somehow get muddled up in myself that what is me? So I think our education system has to, uh, and this goes to Shruti's question also, like, do I want to become a Biswa Guru? Before becoming a Biswa Guru, perhaps I have to know where I'm coming from. What do I stand for? And that's very, very important. And Rajiji has been fighting his whole life for this and being a computer scientist and a technological person, he is kind of given a very scientific spin to all our heritage, cultural heritage, which has been uh, kind of um, kept as a baggage, cultural baggage to all modern educated people. But now I think Indians are waking up to that realization and it's perhaps not only a person like Rajiv Ji or somebody, I mean, I have grown up with a father who went to Harvard and he had done his research in uh, Adityism and Wendy Doniger's guide is my father's guide also. So, I mean, I have grown up with those things uh, and I took it for granted that this comes naturally, but unfortunately, like Professor Sudarshan says, as we need to teach our younger generation what we are as Indians are, what do we represent? And uh, Rajiv Ji, my only request to you is that you are doing a great job, but perhaps we need to do something which can inspire our young uh, you know, a younger generation to take up this issue of identity. What is Indian identity? Indian identity is not necessarily a Hindu identity or as such. And I saw a question somebody asking, do you agree with uh, the Prime Minister Modi and other things? And here also, I want to take up what you cited about uh, Biden. When Biden was taking his oath as uh, you know, the president of America, he had such a big, uh, you know, uh, the Holy Bible in front of him. Nobody questioned that. 
and in india if you do that i think every opposition party will and perhaps this is because we are ourselves not sure what where we are coming from what is our heritage what do we stand for you know and uh, if anyone does that he's either branded as right or left or whatever but there is something in between in indians are not only right or not only left we have amalgamated all the diverse uh, you know forces that shape us and i think uh, we are very thankful raji ji for sparing such time and making this uh, when you your first public appearance after your thing and we hope that we will see you for many more conversations and really uh, gratitude from all all of us at this university thank you thank so you much. and just one uh, addition to what you said the biden biden's bible very proudly is he calls it this is my family bible in <laughs> other words it's like saying ki mere family this is my family rigveda this has been passed down generation to generation it's a night uh, now very old and this is the who i am so imagine it's not just some bible book he bought from amazon the day before yeah. this is family bible this is a very sacred bible and this is a very liberal president and so what's wrong they are able to do it why yeah. why, why aren't we able to do it this is this is the yeah. this is a very important point that you have raised and thank you so much yes because there was a question here about prime minister modi and if modi says that i mean he is a hindu and he has to do something for the hindu temples where has he gone wrong and if i say i am a hindu and i don't want uh, uh, you know christians to enter puri temple I, i mean how am i wrong i mean i don't understand i mean don't i have the right to you know kind of establish my identity as whatever i am and why should i feel ashamed about it i think that's the fundamental question every indian has to ask himself or herself that what is my identity where do i place myself among all the diverse forces it's not about fighting with each other but finding a common ground and that's what perhaps youngsters have to uh, have to realize and take the nation ahead you know in the mormon temple the mormon temple in in, in salt lake city in utah which is a main temple uh, people who are not members are not allowed i mean this is true in many places you got to, <laughs> the church has a membership system uh, you actually have to join them like you're joining a country club or some kind of a club you join a member pay a membership fee uh, they have a database of who are the members of this church and there are certain privileges that members are allowed non members are not allowed so this business that if you are if you're not a, a, a participant in this faith you you're not allowed in a sacred space what is wrong with it because you know the the the, the, the every faith has rules like that yeah, you, non uh, non muslims cannot go to makkah and get inside so what is wrong with that i mean the, 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 there are certain uh, certain uh, spaces ge sacred geography there is certain thing called sacred geography where certain sites and certain locations there has to be a protocol who gets in with what kind of food he's eaten what kind of clothes he's got to take his shoes off whatever uh, what what is in his mind what is his is his point of view all of that has to be aligned with what the purpose of this place is this is true for every religion every faith native americans had sacred grounds where it would be considered sacrilegious for a, a, a person who's not bona fide to come and mess around and Uh, you know so so this is indians need to understand uh, international traditions we need to do purv paksha on other people when people when, rather than getting defensive you should be able to put all the stuff out on the table and say how many mosques there are how many uh, synagogues there are how many churches there are all kind of establishments uh, where where only certain members are allowed and 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 and, and this is not something to be apologetic for so i'm glad you are raising all this yes yes and i'm so thankful that uh, yes. this conference dr batra has given us a platform to discuss all these issues thank and thank you once again with all my sincere gratitude for raji ji for coming here and addressing us thank you thank you so much uh, uh, professor gopanayak she is director of global language center here and uh, thank you so much rajiv ji and everybody here professor pata bendi professor sudarshan and uh, with this we'll conclude this session and tomorrow we meet at 10 o'clock sharp for the second day of this conference so thank you very much